History happened everywhere. The verdict. This is our after show podcast where we look back at the most recent episode. This is metal in Azerbaijan during the 8th century. So if you haven't listened to that, go back and check it out or else you will encounter spoilers ahead. I used to have two sugars in a cup of tea, but now any touch of sugar in tea, it's horrible. Hello, you're listening to History Happened Everywhere. I'm here in the studio as ever with the wonderful Ryan Weir. Hello. And we have the devastatingly dapper Mr. Paul Dursley. Hello. Happy New Year to you, Mr. Dursley. Well, it's a bit late for that, isn't it? How late in the year can you say Happy New Year to someone <laughs> if you haven't seen them previously that year? I think right up until the end of the year. <laughs> so if you only see someone once a year yeah. on New Year's Eve. New Year's Eve, you, Happy New Year. I suppose you do, yeah, as long as you leave before midnight, otherwise you've blown it for next year. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's true. <laughs> so we had a little bit of a break, Mr Dursley. I hope you made good use of your time. What did you get up to? I had a nice, relaxing, doing nothing sort of Christmas and New Year. That sounds wonderful. I didn't wonderful. think I, I didn't think I needed it, but you know, a change was as good as a rest. I know it's a cliche, but the thing with most cliches is they're true. Well, it does creep up on you, doesn't it? Stress and tiredness and just general life business. So, to all our listeners out there, take a moment, take a deep breath, and relax. Episode 43, guys. That's pretty good going. We're in the year 2022. Another 40 episodes still to come this year. Like, I just want to look ahead and see what fun countries we're going to visit. It is exciting, isn't it? Although <laughs> the first two, we've kind of stuck to the same area. But mm. who knows what the randomizer will throw up next time. Uh, but I very much enjoyed our episode last week, but I... It's just faint memories I've got of what may or may not have been said. I, I really would help if somebody could recap what occurred. How about I give you a 60 second review? Okay, well, I think you should do yes, that. Yes, because you've got it written down and I haven't. Exactly, <laughs> that will help. <laughs> uh, well, I think you should do that, Ryan, and I think you should start approximately now. We started our first episode of 2022 in the Transcaucasian country of Azerbaijan. Known as the Land of Fire, this is a fascinating country that is as famous for its landscape of sun and snow as eternal flames and muddy volcanoes. Travelling back in time, we learned that Azerbaijan's important position on the map between Europe and Asia enticed a great number of land-hungry empires to invade. In the 7th century, the Muslim conquest found its way into the region, with the Caliphate starting an intense rivalry with the Kazakh Khanate, an empire of flail waving warlords north of the Caucasus mountain range. This rivalry hit its peak during the 8th century with many memorable and gruesome battles in and around Azerbaijan. In terms of metal, we covered the importance of Azerbaijan's position on the Silk Road and discovered how the international community brought metallic objects of all varieties to its doorstep. We discussed the importance of the curved metal blade known as the Simtar in helping the Caliphate turn the tide during battle, and we wondered at the political chicanery that took place between leaders of empires when it came to producing the design of a gold coin. As the kids might say, this episode was fire. That was last week's episode done. Summarised nicely, nice one son. Now we're over to a young Dursley who's gonna tell you what he thought of the He'll take you apart without any care. He's the lovely Paul Dursley. The lovely Paul Dursley. Oh, yes, it's all flooding back to me now. Yes, uh, well, I personally thoroughly enjoyed it, found it educational and enlightening, but my opinion is not worth a jot, my friend. It's invalid. It all comes down to Mr. Dursey. So, Paul, first impressions, how did you feel about the first episode of the new year? I did run some numbers on it, and we never, we never got to the time period until you were 32 minutes in, <laughs> which is just over 50% of the way through it. <laughs> <laughs> there was a lot of history that I needed to give. It wouldn't have made sense if I'd just jumped straight into the 8th century. Okay. And then you never mentioned much about metal in it, did you? There was the metal that was sold on the Silk Road, the coins, there was the simtar, there was the heavy metal at the end. So these are things made of metal, okay. <laughs> it was metal. And also uh, Bargic's metal, his character. as As, what, a... as in M-E-T-T-L-E. Yes. 
<laughs> I didn't realise it was spelled that way. But yes. He's, he's clutched that okay. straw. He's holding on to it. <laughs> okay, okay, well, actually, that, that, that probably works in your favour. Ooh, yes. Oh, nice move. Score. That was silky skills. <laughs> I don't know if it's true though. He did. Did he have metal? I'd say he I did. I would say so. Yeah. yeah. He was certainly tested. <laughs> it certainly was. I think we have to address the elephant in the room. There was. Well, there was an elephant in the <laughs> yeah. room. Uh, I, but I somehow suspect that's not the elephant in question now. So, what? Name your elephant, Paul. What's the mountain range called? The Caucasus Mountain Range. Yes, the Caucasus. Do you know how I know it's the Caucasus Mountain Range? Because I shouted at you. Yes, because I got a text message (laughs) with a little voice note on it that just went, It's Caucasus! That was it. That was the message. (laughs) But does that mean we should be calling Caucasian people Caucasian? Caucasoids. (laughs) Caucasoids. <laughs> How do you identify Caucasoid? Aliens from a Marvel movie. The Caucasoids are coming. <laughs> I don't think you're. I don't think they're allowed to call it Caucasian anymore. Are they? I believe they're IC4. Oh, really? IC4 is that they, they, they've now given them codes. I I don't know what they are. Uh, IC4 I think is the definition for what used to be called Caucasian. Okay. Is it like a Pantone? I was going to say, I favour a Pantone system where you have various cars, you hold them against your arm (laughs) and you figure out exactly what code you are. And when you've been on holiday, you have to adjust all your book paperwork (laughs) because you're a slightly different shade. (laughs) I've seen seen a a cup of tea that's got all the Pantone colours close to a cup of tea so you could have builder's tea or weak tea. (laughs) Same principle. Quite right too. You need systems for these things. Things Mm. need to be orderly. Which, funnily enough, makes me think about the coins that you were talking about, right? Mm. You were talking about how it's very important that the coin is the same size and shape and stamped in a, a uniform manner. Yeah, it was. Yeah, according to the Umayyad Caliphate, it was um, very important. So, Paul, you strike me as someone who has interest in coins and such. Is it numismatic, something like that? Numismatism, yes. Are you, are you, are you a coin collector? Yes, co- coins are quite interesting. I, I don't know very much about them, but I know... I, I know some odd little factoids about them. Do you know about the Trial of the Picks, P-Y-X? No. no. The Trial of the Picks, it still actually happens uh, every year. A number of coins are taken from circulation, or t- taken from the coins that have just been minted and are assayed by weighed and measured, etc. And it's it's still done. In, in the past, it used to be done, obviously, for clipping coins and various various things like that, making sure the gold content was right. But it's still actually done today. PYX, I think it's from the Latin but I can't say. Hello. This is the voice of the internet. First held in the 12th century, the trial of the Picts takes place in London in the Hall of the Worshipful Company of Goldsmiths. At the trial, the deputy master of the Royal Mint is put before a high court judge as metallurgical assayers and selected leaders from the financial world sample coins from the Mint's output. The coins being assessed are stored in wooden boxes which is where the word pix derives, from the Greek word pixis, meaning wooden box. In 2020, a total of 25,000 coins were put on trial, and were found to be accurate and precise. Thank you. All right. Okay. No, that's cool. Uh, now, uh, you said something, Paul, that uh, triggered me in a positive way, which was you mentioned clippers, because all this talk of coins inspired me to have a little dig around uh, about coins. And firstly, I wanted to look at the coins that you described, because mm. I thought that was quite interesting. And the ones I saw were a little bit off centre. I had in my mind, obviously, our coins, which are so incredibly uniform. But you could clearly see where someone had just kind of whacked a stamp on a yeah. circle of metal, and there was a bit splodging over the side, effectively, which was quite Yeah, they were. They certainly they certainly weren't uniform you know coins weren't really uniform up until the 17th century ah well and that's also made me think they had this splodgy edge and uh it made me think that our coins not all of them but some Mm. of them have their little ridges on the the edge of the coin they do yeah uh and i thought well what do they do? Decus et tutamen, as it says on some pound coins what does it say and what did that mean for the audience? <laughs> a decorset to Tarban uh, it effectively means a decoration and a protection. Ah. So, yes, the little ridges. What would happen in olden times? Yeah. You, coins without things around the edge were all supposed to be uniform, but and they were made of more precious metals. They weren't just 
tin and mm. alloys that they are today are actual gold and silver so people called clippers would just shave bits off the edge of the coin mm. just just enough so you wouldn't notice but it gives them a bit of extra gold or silver and that would then lighten the coin but you wouldn't really notice and they'd melt down the excess uh, and that way they would get extra coins out of the coins they had in their oh bag. i see so you take a 0.001 gram of a gold coin and you, you take do that a hundred times, times and you do okay right okay so these um little rigid on the side of the coins uh, these are called reeded edges apparently mean that if you did that you would see a shaved bit on the edge of your coin oh right i thought it was for like grip <laughs> i just thought like you could, it doesn't slip out of your hands when your hands are wet well it's a practical addition that it gives you a bit of extra purchase when yeah. flinging it at a vending machine right because they're in your fingers the whole time right you might have been eating like a greasy burger or something <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> like that you had your eye on the practical there <laughs> That's why Isaac Newton was knighted, actually. Nothing to do with his scientific work. He was the master of the mint, and he oversaw the great recoinage. No way, really. Because most of the English coins at the time were, as Pete was saying, they were clipped. I think the, the word they use is debased. And so it was decided to sort of recoin everything. So everything was called in, melted down, and then the, then the coins were minted again in the new form. You can imagine these coins coming in like wafer thin piece of tin foil. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I think this one's been had. <laughs> Uh, so I looked up the name of the dinar because I was curious where that like originated from because it, it had been used for centuries beforehand and uh, it originates from the Roman times. It was a Roman coin, the denarius. As in LSD, pounds, shillings and pence. It's, it's the origin of the English penny. The, what, the, den- the, the denarius? Oh, is that the D of pence? Yes, LSD is... Pound, shillings, and pence. The pence pence is D for denarius, S for solidus, L for libra. Well, there you go. Cool. Well, I also looked up, because I thought I'm going to buy Ryan a coin. You can buy Umayyad coins. Can you? Yeah. Okay. I I found a couple at auction. (laughs) Okay. About 500 quid ago, though. Oh, okay. (laughs) I didn't choose to purchase you the coin. Well, that's interesting, because I looked on eBay, because I was going to buy you one. (laughs) I was. I was going to buy you both one, and see if I could get one. But funnily enough, yeah, gold coin, an ancient (laughs) historical gold coin. (laughs) 700 pounds, yeah. About $1,000. Then that took me down another rabbit hole, and I found that the most expensive coin ever sold sold at auction Mm -hmm. 10 million dollars wow for and this is interesting because you'd think it'd be a super old coin no it's a 1794 silver dollar okay that's not that old 10 million yeah exactly the the front is a profile of lady liberty with flowing hair hence the flowing hair silver dollar and the american eagle on the back unsurprisingly and only about 1800 of the coins were ever made so they're very rare which is they must be some of the first dollar coinage as well well some people say it was the first silver dollar struck well all of the colonies had their own currency didn't they it was invariably called pounds shillings and pence but they were all at different rates to the pound sterling so like a massachusetts pound may have been equivalent to uh, 10 English shillings, for example. Yeah, a Maryland pound may have been equivalent to 15 English shillings. Oh, that's just going to run great confusion. Ex- I think they did the right thing. Exactly. <laughs> so they all had different currencies. And they sort of, I think they tied it together in something called a continental currency, which was still done in pound, shillings, and pence. And then just after that, they changed it to dollar. Which everyone, I suspect, was grateful for as they were trying to work out their change in pound, shillings, and pence. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, the interesting the interesting thing is why on earth would America in the 18th century choose a decimal unit of currency? Yeah, it didn't catch on, did it? In terms of use of decimalization, generally. <laughs> no, but it's but it's very odd given that then and even more now it's a stronghold of non decimal things. So, like shares were still demarcated in 30 seconds of a dollar up until only a few years ago. So it's odd that they went for 100 units rather than 240 or 144 other other common ones it's very interesting because there weren't that many decimal currencies then yeah that's i, I favor that that's why i prefer a car that measures speed in furlongs per fortnight <laughs> furlongs per fortnight okay that's an interesting <laughs> measure do you know how fast you're going sir nope <laughs> because it I'm has the right it. dimension anyway <laughs> 
There is a, there is one English coin or British coin that's incredibly rare. I think it's a 1938 penny. It was only ever released as a proof, so it never went into circulation. But there was a mistake, and something like three of them went into circulation. And Seems odd that three would just get in. <laughs> they just fell off the side. Unless your guy's putting one to the side every day. <laughs> For the intrinsic value of the coin, the, the actual value is enormous. It's many, 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 many millions of times the value of a coin, which is, you know, worth less than half a penny. It's a long distance, wasn't it, the Silk Road, right? Mm. You've got to imagine there was a lot of coins that were dropped just along the way and also buried, hidden. All, so many stories over the, what, centuries of the Silk Road? I mean, it went for 600 years, longer? So you yes. think of all the little uh, anecdotes and stories of these traders that were, you know, they'd heard there were bandits up the road ahead, so they hid their stuff before you know, at night and then came back and they got killed or whatever, and that stuff's just hiding out there in the desert somewhere. I, I hear the sound of 100,000 detectorists holstering <laughs> their detectors and <laughs> heading towards the Silk Road right there. I'm sure it's been done, yeah. It's, it's one of those incredibly romantic places isn't it the silk road caravans on the mm, silk road it's very evocative isn't it yeah. yes practically speaking it was probably really boring it was boring Cameling and dangerous camel every day and dangerous yeah if there was lots of money going backwards and forwards along this route there would be highwaymen or the equivalents wouldn't there of course yeah absolutely it's, it's always a bigger fish there is always a bigger fish with a bigger sword or scimitar Segwaying cleverly from coins into tax, we were talking about the jizya. Yeah, the jizya, yeah. The jizya, which is the tax on uh, non -Muslims. Muslims. And uh -huh. uh, we may have given a slightly wrong appearance that you were excessively taxed for being a non Muslim. The Muslims were also subject to a tax, I, I discovered. So Muslims have to pay zakat, which is another tax, and it's explicit, explicitly used for welfare projects. And I just thought it was worth mentioning because it sounded like, yeah, you don't have to pay anything, especially the. <laughs> sketch we did really heavily implied that it did, in fact yeah. the muslims were also paying tax and uh performing welfare activities i thought okay worth balancing the playing field there on that <laughs> yeah no fact. that's a fair point <laughs> all right good show it's like income tax was isn't it income tax was levied i think it was after the napoleonic wars as a temporary tax and it was some ridiculously low amount of some, something like five old pence in the pound so five over 240th of a pound and this temporary tax is still there, and it's now forty-five over six uh, over a hundred of a pound. I don't know what you're talking about. Top rate tax. Ah, okay. But, but I still don't know what you're talking about. Well, a t a ta income tax when it was introduced was five old pennies to the old pound. So that is five over two hundred and fortieths of a pound. But tax has always been a thing. When you say income tax, there has always been tax, right? The tax collectors are biblical. The taxes. Know, long, a much longer history than that. So what, what distinguishes an income tax from all the other taxes in history? Um, I'm no economist, but I think an income tax is a, what's called a non-hypothecated tax. So it is a tax on income rather than a tax for something else. Ah, so not the levy for the army, but it's in fact just, can I have some of your money, please? <laughs> Yeah, yeah it's it's army, so. like <laughs> it's sort of we still not for much longer have a hypothecated tax here, which is called the television license. So that is something that you pay specifically for a reason, whereas the income tax you pay it for multiple reasons. It just goes into a pot and is used as exactly. Yeah, interesting. Is it? Let's talk flails. Ooh. <laughs> let's, let's talk flails. I want to talk flails. Um, I was reminded of when you were talking about uh, the not quite ball on a stick, stick on a stick mm. attached by string, that, of course, they're very similar and of similar origin to the nunchucks that we will be familiar with from various kung fu movies of my youth. That's right. Also a threshing Sakura tool. Killers and Enter the Dragon. Yes. I won't bore you with an even longer list of <laughs> kung fu movies that I have watched. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, they it's a similar sort of story, isn't it? It's a rice flail in that case hmm. developed into a weapon 
which again is more likely to render you self unconscious as a user than, mm. than the enemy. But we talk about that like, yeah, yeah, it's just a rice flail, right? But what what is a rice flail? Because I'm thinking if you're hitting the plant to take the little rice seed, what is a rice? Yeah, the husks. They've the husks. got a little husk, so you sort of whack them, yeah, to to separate them. So you crush them up a bit, essentially. So, okay, but, but the it, green inside is quite hard, isn't it? So that stays intact. But aren't you just like whacking it halfway across the the field? No, you put it in a bucket or a, you know, ah, lay it out you and you whack it. it. And then certainly with wheat, you uh, separate the wheat from the chaff by lobbing it in the air. Yeah. And then the very light papery covering blows away with the wind and the heavier grains fall down. And okay. then you're left with lovely grain and not nasty chaff. Because in my head, you're walking through the field, <laughs> whacking the plants. <laughs> And then you've just got rice floating everywhere. Did you think this was some kind of harvesting method? Yeah, that's that's exactly what I thought it was. (laughs) That's exactly, I thought you'd be harvesting the plants. That does sound fun. (laughs) Not very effective. It's not effective. You thought they were just hammering the grains. This is what I was thinking. You'd get like rice grains, you know, 20 feet across the field. I don't want to be on a desert island with you. And then you have to go and pick them all up. I'm thinking, well, this is ridiculous. <laughs> Tell me you've been thinking that for years and years and years and you didn't just think about it with the rice fl- with the flail. No, I just thought about it with the flail. Oh, as a I'm sorry. I the idea of you as a child, <laughs> lifelong belief in these people just walking through the fields. <laughs> Nunchucking plants. Swinging their flail around uh, and then painstakingly picking up yeah, whatever the, the rice or the grains. That's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> You mentioned briefly Damascus steel. Oh, Damascene steel. Now, you can buy knives today which are described as Damascus steel. I'm not sure it's exactly the same thing because there's a patterning on Damascus steel that you buy today. Is it actually the same as that original Damascus steel or is it just a, a just happens to be a modern, the, there slightly is, different thing? It's the same type, but there was one that was used for the swords and then there was this other one which we can now buy today and it does have this very strange like patterning on the actual steel itself. It is to do with the alloy and how it's actually created. I, I know but about they, the modern ones because a lot of it is is made now in Japan. I have a Japanese knife that has a uh, damaskin shield, <clears throat> damaskin shield, damaskin. I can't say it. <laughs> that has You've broken. That has, a, <laughs> that has a blade of that steel. How would you uh, describe that steel for? <laughs> <laughs> it has a wavy effect in because it's it's like flaky pastry and steel. It's a fold it over loads of times. Yeah, but so me foy in French, thousand folds. That's effectively what you're doing with this with this metal. You're stretching the metal and folding it on, compressing it down, stretching it, folding it, compressing it, stretching it, which makes it incredibly strong. And that's how you get the effects in the metal. It's quite beautiful to look at. It is, yes. Agreed. I'd rather I'd rather eat a flaky pastry though. <laughs> <laughs> With tea. <laughs> 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 So, moving on from matters Marshall, I am interested in jam in tea. Are you? Yes. I I did a very brief Googling. It does seem to be a sort of broader Russian habit to put jam in your tea. Interesting. Um, But now I I don't know if, Paul, you've ever encountered jam in your tea, Russian style Not jam in tea. I certainly know that the Tibetans put butter in or yak butter in their tea. Have you tried this delicious beverage? I've not, uh, but yak butter is sort of just yak milk. You could probably put butter in coffee. Yeah, you put cream in coffee, so why not the next step up, which is butter? One knob or two. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about Yanar Dag. Yanar Dag was the name of the uh, hillside that is eternally aflame. I did ah, have a yes. goal of that to see, because I, I, it's a very difficult thing to visualise a hill on fire. Yeah, unless you live in Los Angeles. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> well, that's kind of where you go to, don't you, these wildfires? Uh, and yeah, it's a thin, porous sandstone 
layer, which has this hydrocarbon gas, which sort of just keeps on emanating from it. And uh, the, it's claimed that the fire was started in the 1950s by a careless shepherd who was just, I don't know, lighting a cigarette or something and started this fire. And of course, once it started, there's no real way of putting that out. Uh, but there is also another site. It's known as the Fire Temple near Baku. And it has, uh, it's similar, it's sort of semi-porous ground with gases emanating from it, only those gases ran out some time ago. So now they're fed from a gas main, just for tourists. <laughs> <laughs> so if you go there, just bear in mind, it might not be entirely natural. So perhaps we should move to the main and final event, the scorecard. Paul Dursley, are you ready? Yes, you have to tell me the subcategories. Okay, so subcategory one is educational content. Were you informed, enlightened, educated? It's an, er uh, it's an area of the world that I knew little about, and I now know a little bit more about it. Sounds a like very little bit more me. about it. That's so positive. I will give a... B minus for that. I, I think it's an interesting part of the world. I, I would like to go there. Me too. He's trying to suppress his glee, but it is manifest. My arms are aloft in joyous victory. Moving on. Entertainment factor. What are you thrilled, excited, laughing, crying? The gamut of emotions was run. Or did you enjoy it at all? There were too many little skits in it this time, I think. Too oh, many. Too many. Okay. The, uh, the punchlines were telegraphed ahead. <laughs> I knew he was going to be something to do with pigs. Yeah, he was a pig farmer. He was a pig farmer. <laughs> I, I think, sorry, I can only give a C minus. I'm disappointed, I'll be honest. <laughs> so, Dursley Factor, do you feel kinship? Did you did it tickle your funny bone? Did that ineffable sense of Dursliness come across this episode? Yes. I thought it was an inter I did think it was an interesting episode. Mainly the country. Obviously, the country was fascinating and that whole era and the wars. Mm -hmm. Okay, we had very little about the time <laughs> period and the <laughs> subject. <laughs> Don't be too uh, the country, of the really. <laughs> so, but it's an interesting part of the world that I, I suppose you can call it this. It's the edge of the fertile crescent, isn't it? So Ooh, that's beautiful. They should call it that. What the edge of the fertile crescent? Yeah, Come for land of fire, fire and stands all the time. <laughs> that's more metal. To be fair, will be marketing voice. <laughs> I will give you a B minus. That's good. So Two promising. B minuses and a C minus. And now all rise. Any final words in your defence, Mr. Arnweir? Um, yeah. So, uh, Your Honour? My Lord, I think. My Lord. I wish to plea... Uh, Insanity. For... Insanity. <laughs> <laughs> I wish to plea in insane. So if you could bear that in mind, that would be great. Granted. <laughs> Thank you, your, <laughs> my Lord. Had you mailed him some sump oil for a nice bath, he might have managed to boost your <laughs> grade a little bit. Barrel of four stars, you said. So, the final verdict. Mr. Paul Dursley, Your Honour, Judge, Your Highness, my Lord, what is your final grade for Ryan Wee's episode? I think, do you know, as it's a new year, I might, I'm going to be generous. And I will give a B minus for the whole thing. The crowd goes Score! wild. The journalists are rushing to the phone. The verdict is in, and it's a good one. <laughs> it was it was very close between a C plus and a B minus. Escaped it. Nice work. Well, I think that's absolutely deserved. So I thought it was a terrific episode. It was the plea of insanity that helped kick it over its edge. Never goes never goes astray. <laughs> insanity plea. <laughs> I would always recommend it. Thank you, my lord. I appreciate your uh, generosity and your kindness and your consideration. Yes, I'll expect something in the post. Understood. But not a horse's head. How about a barrel of oil? Oh, yes, so I could have a bath. <laughs> <laughs> but only for 10 minutes. 
before they start to oh, peel yeah. your yeah. skin off. And... I love that. You know, <laughs> you, you sort of, yeah, this is, this is a really good way of doing it, but you can only do it for 10 minutes or it will kill you. Right, that, everybody, is our show for this week, first of the new year. Well done, everyone. Well done, Ryan. Good thank score. You. And thank you, Mr. Dursley. Thank you all for listening. Pleasure. And as ever, if you would like to get in touch with us about anything we've talked about or just to say hello, tell us you missed us over the break, you can reach out to us on social media through hhepodcast.com or email us at Pete and Ryan at hhepodcast.com. Yep, and we'd love to hear from you. And you never know, you might end up featured on a future show if you get in contact. And another way to definitely feature on a future episode is to rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts and your recommendation it really helps to sort of bring the show out to new listeners uh, if you are on TikTok Instagram Facebook Twitter the social media stuff you can find us at HHE Podcast and subscribe to those and you'll get a little alert when we post one minute animated HHE Bites that we do yep and we're going to be back again soon with our next episode which is is Uzbekistan on the subject of smell uh, the time period is first phone to iPhone and if you can't get enough of the show check out our back catalogue of episodes which you can find in your podcast app YouTube or on our website hhepodcast.com it's fortunate you can't smell his back catalogue <laughs> <laughs> alright on that dubious note a huge thank you to the judge himself thank you Paul pleasure uh, and that's it I guess all that's left to say is you've been listening to You know, I saw I saw some police on horses dro- walking past today, just just outside my flat. I thought that was quite impressive. Do you think police horse people start out as keen equestrians and then you join the police because it's one of the few occupations you can ride a horse all day, or police are told you're going to be a horse policeman, you have to learn how to ride a horse? I think it's a bit of both. Yeah. I.e., you join the police. To, has anybody ever ridden a horse before? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> hands up. Well, I'm surprised that police are even using horses these days. They're good for crowd control. Yeah, yes. It's just scary. I find the horses quite terrifying, so mm. it works on me. <laughs> I often wonder what other animals the police could be using. If there were, you know, you've got the dog police and you've got horse police, why don't you have bear police? That would stop me. Hippopotamus police. <laughs> Hippopotamus police. <laughs> Hippopopolis. <laughs> <laughs> they run fast. Right? They're terrifying. They're they the kill one of the most people. dangerous animals yeah. there are. Yeah. That would that would make you think twice before you've completed your shoplifting. But hippos tapping on the window. The hippopopolis. <laughs> coming after you. Yeah. The, 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 pro- the, the problem is there's not there's even less of the shop left after the hippopopolis <laughs> <Yeah>. come and get <laughs> <laughs> oh my lord are you okay <laughs> yes i had a a dry biscuit i think a bit of it must have got stuck in my throat i mean you're just the gift that keeps on giving <laughs> <laughs>